right? First and foremost, I'd like to say good afternoon. All right, we'll try again. Good afternoon. All right, welcome to Inside the Mind of Millennials, how to build services for them as well as work with them. My name is Mandela Schumacher Hodge. I'm the founding portfolio services director at K4 Capital, a seed stage social impact venture capital firm based in Oakland, California. Do I have any Bay Area folks in the room? Hey, hey, Bay Area. Um, <laughs> I, we are thrilled that you guys could join us. I have the privilege of being the moderator for this session. And if you've seen the bios, if you see the people up stage, on stage, you can see that it's definitely an esteemed panel. So thank you all for joining. We have exactly 53 minutes and 55 seconds, so we are going to try our best to not just keep this love, uh, this conversation surface level, but really go a little bit deeper. So panelists, please be warned, I will be pushing back a little bit as much as I can to make sure the audience gets their value for showing up today. I'm also going to try my best to reserve maybe 10, 15 minutes for questions at the end. So if you have one as we go along, please reserve it. Please understand their questions, not necessarily share outs. Um, so make sure you position that accordingly. Um, so again, this panel is all about millennials and just to level set. Uh, if you don't know, ASU GSB has defined millennials as that generation born between 1980 and 2000. So I think that covers, if my math is right, 16-year-olds um, to 36-year-olds. Uh, is that right? Any mathematicians in here? OK, nodding of heads. All right, maybe they don't want to call me out. Um, but basically, this is the largest workforce in, um, in America right now. 80 million millennials making up 25% of the population. So it's an important conversation to have. And just to get a sense of who's in the room, uh, by a show of hands, and feel free to participate, panelists, how many of you in this room would consider yourself, whether you fall into that category of the years or not, uh, millennials? Any millennials in the room right now? Okay, you can look around, get a sense. All right, great. How many of you, by a show of hands, work at a company or organization led by millennials? Anyone in here working for millennials? All right, okay. And uh, maybe this is the largest group. How many of you uh, hire, manage, work with millennials? Anyone in this room? All right, great. We got something for everybody. You guys came to the right place. Um, so without any further hesitation, I'm going to give everyone up here an opportunity to introduce themselves. But I'd like it to focus around the conversation of millennials. So my question for the panelists, and we'll start with you here, okay. Kate, is what do you do and how does it relate to millennials? Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of EduSense. I am a millennial, and I manage a lot of millennials. Um, we're a marketplace for educational products. so. Uh, we match buyers um, with ed tech companies, so many of you probably, um, uh, teachers and parents and homeschoolers. Uh, so we actually, I would say probably 80% of our workforce is millennials. Great. Hey, I'm Marlon Nichols, I'm founding partner of Cross Culture Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm focused on consumer insights. So what that means is we study cultural and uh, consumer behavior in over 180 countries. And given that uh, millennials are such a large uh, part of the population and such influencers, a lot of that research is centered around their behaviors. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Lee Jang. I'm a vice president at GSV. And uh, obviously, we host this conference, but we also invest in a number of companies that are led by millennial entrepreneurs. And uh, I just think it's fascinating that this is, you could almost call it the entrepreneur generation uh, that we're seeing today. And I read, I think I read this stat last year, but it's from one survey where, uh, where they said 40% of <laughs> sorry. Just make sure you're I was reading a survey data from last year that said something like 40% of millennials would rather uh, work for a lower salary if they could fire their boss. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so my name is Andrew Sutherland, and I am the founder of Quizlet. Quizlet is a learning platform primarily for high school, uh, also some middle school, some college students. And uh, so I, huge amount of our users, we have about 18 million monthly active users. Huge number of those are millennials. And then we also have about 42 people working at the company, and most of them are millennials. Uh, John Carson, uh, I'm the CEO of Admissions Hero. Uh, I've built three companies with Millennials, uh, Family Education Network that had 300 people, most 
were under the age of 30. The last, uh, last one, bidding for good, uh, 50 people, uh, most under 30. And I just joined Admissions Hero, which is uh, three Harvard dropouts age 20. <laughs> You're the CEO, right? Yep. Okay, so we're going to get into that a little bit more. Um, thank you all for being here again. Thank you for those who are coming in. Again, there's some seats up front, so don't be shy. Feel free to come up. Um, it's a packed room, so uh, again, there's three up here. Um, the first kind of thing I want to throw out to you is I kind of defined millennials by the time frame of 1980, 2000, give or take, depending on which source you're using. But I'm curious uh, to ask, what do you guys think characterizes millennials? And uh, given your work, Marlon, uh, around the world and the studies you guys have done, I don't know if that's any sound folks, uh, but can you tell us what kind of traits do millennials have, if any? Can you group them? I think it's difficult to um, group people in general because we're all individuals. Um, but if we're going to go down that road, um, <laughs> I'd say it's a, it's a group of folks that are uh, more so interested in experiences um, than, um, than owning things, for instance. Would rather spend money on, on a great experience, would rather uh, work uh, in a lower paying environment that gives them the flexibility to have a great experience, um, wants a high level of autonomy in the things that um, that they're doing. Who's that home? <laughs> uh, in the things that they're that they're doing, um, and uh, I, I think a number of things uh, around that. But I want to give opportunity for everyone else to chime in too. Anyone else? I guess the, the one word that I keep seeing over and over again, and I think it's true, is the word purpose. And you hear it in every line of work in every uh, you know, survey or just if you speak to people that every millennial wants to be involved in something that they feel is a, there's a purpose to and they're connected with that purpose. And same as you know, Marlon, you were just saying about experiences and rather than uh, assets and physical things, uh, those experiences you know, align with their purpose and, and they work on things that align with their purpose. And, and that's kind of, you know, that if, if there was one thing that characterizes millennials, I would say that's it. <coughs> Yeah, John. Um, I actually. Let me just pause real quick. The sound people in the back, can you guys hear that? I don't know if it's just me. Do we know this? Like uh, working towards making an impact. I think a lot of the ed tech companies. 
companies I talk to don't have a hard time hiring because we do have a mission driven focus to what we're doing. And I think we obtain really great talent because people are interested in making a change in the world. Um, so yeah, I don't yeah. Who wants you to turn your mic back on? Oh. <laughs> All right. And what about Marlon and Lee um, and Andrew? If you have something to share, for sure. You want to uh, go first? Yeah. Go. Well, I was just going to add, add to something that he said, uh, which was that uh, when – so I went to MIT, and I arrived in 2008 as an undergrad, and uh, there was not a very entrepreneurial culture <laughs> there when I got there. But by the time I left, I would say there were way more people interested in doing startups and uh, doing their own companies or joining startups. And I think I think there was uh, you know a pretty big shift even in those four years of people watching the 2008 collapse and seeing that uh, you m might not make as much money in finance, but it also really wasn't cool on campus. And uh, and there was this sort of alternative path, uh, and there were companies like Dropbox that were founded at MIT uh, that w that were like the coolest thing. And so uh, I think that there was there was more purpose uh, to be had by going to those companies, and uh, and you could also have a like big financial success, but not in finance. And I think that was a pretty big shift. Yeah, I, gu I guess I would say there's that millennials are, they tend to want to solve big problems because yeah. uh, two, there's a structural reason where the internet, basically we're the first generation that grew up with the internet. I'm, old, I'm actually um, a little bit older than the internet itself. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but it basically allows you to see uh, conversations from all around the world. You can access almost anybody you want to get access to and any idea and that's sort of a structural thing that enables people to go pursue these bigger opportunities and try to solve these problems. And then I think culturally, you're, you, you know, I think uh, actually the, uh, what's the, the Facebook movie, uh, The Social Network, Social was, Network. was hugely influential <laughs> in sh shaping the mentality of college kids everywhere because they, they said, well, I could be that guy in a dorm or that gal in a dorm and, and hack something together and create a $300 billion company. Uh, and so I think there's a cult, there's a cultural narrative, and and so many examples, including some people on this panel, of uh, people just building great companies and, and and affecting change that you don't have to wait ten years, twenty years, thirty years to actually be a leader and and to really uh, shape the world. You could do it in your dorm room, like today. So I think that's really encouraging. Awesome. Several people have obviously walked in. Um, just to frame the conversation again, we're talking about millennials and the gap, the time frame we're working within is the people born between 1980 and 2000. Several of the panelists up here have already shared out some of the characteristics, although they may not all fit into a box. There's different individualistic um, items that need to be taken into consideration. But the things that we're talking about up here are a generation that's growing up with a lot of dysfunction, a lot of disruption, a lot of passion-driven um, individuals who are really looking for a social cause to get behind. Um, so those are some of the things we've heard so far. But I'd like to um, focus on Marlon a bit because uh, likely he's an investor. And I want to know, are you seeing a difference in terms of the entrepreneurs that are coming and asking you guys for funding, pitching ideas? Do these millennials, if they even are millennials, coming to you um, with their ideas, do they have themes that you've identified? Yeah, definitely themes. And, and back to the, the earlier point made, um, they are all individuals. Um, so. I've seen companies that are, you know, trying to create the next Facebook because um, we need another social network, um, <laughs> you know, and just piggybacking off of things that already exist. And then I also see um, entrepreneurs that, that walk in that actually do want to make a difference, uh, do want to solve real and challenging um, problems. Uh, so, you know, they are individuals, um, but there are some common traits that, that um, help them mesh together. And so some of the things that we're seeing, um, is the, the move away from uh, personal ownership to, uh, to, to renting. And that, that goes from the, the digital um, environment to the physical environment. Like there was a, there's a company that's a um, really interesting company, I won't say the name, but the, the founder 
basically created um, a platform that allows you to store your, say, your um, surfboard or your snowboard um, in a physical facility, but you manage it in the digital world. You can lend it out to other, other people. You can rent it out to, to, to other people. Um, and basically, it's, it's taking the burden of owning this thing that you use uh, probably not as, not as frequent, particularly in, in the case of like a snowboard. Um, it's seasonal. And, and you can still gain um, gain gain uh, money from it, and um, and not have to deal with storing it in your closet size apartment, which a lot of millennials live in if they live <laughs> in cities, right? Um, so that's one. Moving from uh, ownership to uh, to renting. Another one is the the con continuation of um, going from downloading to streaming. So you know Netflix, Netflix and chill, right? All those. All those things. There are a lot of things around uh, music that's still going in that direction, right? Uh, we all know Spotify, and um, now there's um, now there's Apple, and and there's a bunch of others. Um, there's also this this concept of um, taking the actual um, artists themselves and and building environments around them that gives. Um, their their fan base more access to, to to who they are outside of you know that's just that performance or just that album or just that movie and um, again making it so that you can't download this stuff but you can you can stream it um, at will and then a, a really big one is the we call it the democratization of healthy lifestyles so for instance in, in the case of food making food um, healthy food and healthy choices available to the masses, not just the wealthy. So one of our companies um, based in, in, um, in LA called Thrive Market, they created a, um, a business that's basically Whole Foods meets, say, BJ's or Costco or something like that, where it's, a, it's an all online store. Um, it's a SaaS business model where you pay a membership, maybe it's $60, um, $60 uh, dollars per year that gives you access to the same products that you find in a Whole Foods, so stuff that is good for you, um, at 30 to 40 percent the cost. Um, in addition to that, we talked about purpose and wanting to, to, to really help the world. For every membership that they, that they sell, they give away a free membership to um, a needing family. Right? So, so now, instead of you know, uh, healthy choices and healthy food only being available and accessible to you know, soccer moms in Palo Alto. Now you can get it in you know, Indiana, in um, the, the suburbs of, or the inner cities of, um, of New York that haven't yet been gentrified. Um, so those are three trends that, um, and there are a ton more, but those are the three that, that we tend to focus on most right now. So John, let's see your hand up. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to Right. Um, I, I want to talk about the sharing uh, aspect of this. A friend of mine uh, grew Zipcar uh, up through their exit, and we talked a lot about, because he was sort of at the front row of the sharing economy. One of the things that was an important factor, and it has continued, is the understanding that this generation has one of the worst balance sheets of any generation that's coming out of school. So in the case of Zipcar, part of what they were finding in the data was the reason people want to share is they don't have the money to go buy cars. Mm -hmm. And they live in metro areas where housing is growing at five times salary increases. And you know, fundamentally, this group has got a level of economic pressure that prior generations didn't. So yeah, they're sharing because that's the best way they can access the service or the product without having to put up the capital. That's exactly right. That's, um, we, we, when we're coming up with a thesis for our fund, we looked at um, Uber. Uh, one of my partners is an early investor, Uber, Lyft, um, and, uh, and some others. And that's exactly what we found. High, um, uh, high, high student loan debt. Um, in order to be able to pay down that debt, you have to take um, relatively high paying jobs, which are going to be in metropolitans. Metropolitans are getting um, overwhelmed with, uh, with, with people. So the more people you have, um, or the more demand you have, up goes the price. So there goes the, the, the cost of living that you, that you talked about. Yeah, and still, you know, I want to I wanna go, go out to the, to the club when I can, and I want to show up in a nice car. 
because girls like guys that show up in nice cars, <laughs> right? So, so Uber allows me to do that. Not <laughs> only, uh, right? Not only uh, am I showing up in a nice car, but look, I got a driver. Um, <laughs> so, right? So, so you, you're you're absolutely right. But that's just you know one of many examples that we saw when we we're looking at this stuff. Awesome, awesome. I'm going to shift it a little bit to hopefully something a bit more controversial that we'll see if you guys all agree. But um, did anyone, by a show of hands or nod, uh, read an article maybe in the last month or so from a former Yelp employee on Medium um, named Talia? Did anyone? No? Okay. Wow, not too many people. Okay, well, there's this article. Don't check it out now. Pay attention. But later, go check out Medium. There's a great article by uh, a young woman who is definitely, I think, in the millennial kind of generation. And it sparked this massive online debate about the state of millennials. And are, they, are their grievances, like student loan debt and everything else, justified? Or are they just lazy, narcissistic whiners? Okay. So we've been talking a lot about the positive aspects of the millennial generation. Generation. So, um, Kate, again, and Andrew, I want to get your thoughts on, is there anything else that we should be taking into consideration when talking about millennials, and especially when it comes to hiring and working with them? I think the Yelp article was really interesting, because I think when I first read it, I was like, wow, she has some guts to put this out on, on the internet. Um, and I was actually a little proud of her. And then I read through it again, and I thought, let me put myself in, you know, Jeremy's shoes, and being the CEO of a company, would I want that out there? Um, I, to be honest, I think she, I mean, I, I don't know how many of you have read it, but it, it, it's interesting because you, you have somebody that's really upset about um, how much she's getting paid and how much work she's putting in. And I think it could have all been avoided had she had somebody, a mentor or something like that at the company that had kind of taken her under his or her wing and, and given her a purpose of working there. Um, you know, she, she claimed that she wasn't making enough money and that, you know, she was in debt and, you know, she wasn't making a living wage. But I do think that if she had enough time and, um, and mentorship, I don't think that that article would have been put out there. So. Yeah. And Andrew, did you get a chance to read it? And if not, you can just comment in general on working with millennials and do certain considerations need to be made or are they just like anybody else coming in? Um, I I would say, so I've, we've probably interviewed, or I've probably interviewed with a thousand or so people in the last like three or four years, and uh, maybe majority of them millennials, but uh, I, th I think the, there isn't as big a difference as, as some might expect. Like, I think the, um, they like have a lot of the same concerns. They the like the first job out of college uh, is is like pretty uncertain. Pretty uh, just like take what you can get. And uh, I think with tech or with, for us like we we like have a pretty pretty awesome company. So uh, but I think most people like don't get to experience something like that. So. Uh, I don't know. It's it's hard for us to say. Okay. Because we're in sort of a like a small bubble of San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. Lee, you look like you have something on your mind. I guess I guess the way I mean you're hearing just on this panel two different narratives. One one of which is this extreme optimism of possibilities of millennials creating change on a scale that's never been seen before and never been done before, and at the same time that you know we're the generation that's most in debt and they have to take these low paying jobs in the case of Yelp and, and some of these other cases. And so there's this like divergent of fate for the millennial generation, mm -hmm. literally. And, and I don't think that uh, that's getting, that's gonna converge. I think, I think the gap is gonna increase even further with very successful millennials who are in their 20s and 30s running hundred billion dollar companies. And then millennials who are you know, effectively uh, very much in debt and just, sort of doing these menial jobs and and I'm not sure what the answer to that problem is but I think that that's going to get worse not better mm -hmm. yeah. I think a, a, a trait that hasn't been mentioned yet is impatience um, and I'm hu I'm a hugely impatient person um, but I think I think that's something that you'll find in a lot of millennials like I don't want to wait to do the job that I really want to do that I think that I believe I'm capable of doing yeah. 
because someone put this arbitrary time frame on it, right? I want, if I'm capable now, I want to do it now. And I think in that article, a lot of the frustration uh, came from that, right? I want to I want to do PR stuff, but you've got me doing uh, customer service because I got to pay my dues, where I do this PR stuff for myself every day. <laughs> um, so it's just you know uh, that's just another another trait um, around millennials, and I think it makes sense. Like if if I'm capable of doing something, don't stick me in some other role because you know, I'm such and such years old, or, um, you know, you don't think I have, uh, I have paid enough dues. So. One thing that we do at, at EduSense is we, every employee sits down with me and their manager and goes over a career roadmap. And they're not tied to, to dates or months or how many years you have to be in something, it's milestones. <laughs> and so if you get to a milestone much faster, you move up in the company more, more quickly. And I think that's something that we've done that has ch dr dramatically changed the way that our workforce views the company. Uh, we have a really great culture because they know exactly where they're going and how to get there. Uh, and I think a lot of, at least in the jobs that I had previously, and I was in corporate world for 10 years before I started this company, I never had a tra trajectory necessarily. I mean, I, I made it from, you know, I don't know, executive assistant all the way up to CMO with, in a couple of years. But I'd worked really hard and I had a smaller company that I was doing that with. But a lot of these millennials don't know what it is that they're getting into when they come into a new job. They think, okay, I may have to work in this job for a year and then go up in a little bitty step. You give them the opportunity to grow and you don't put bounds on them. Um, it's surprising and incredibly rejuvenating to see what they actually do. So that's a little bit to your point. No, that definitely resonates with my personal experiences as well. So when you said, like, they are impatient, they don't want to wait, they don't want boundaries, they want growth opportunities, yeah. that definitely resonates with me. Personal, I'm just one data point, so keep that in consideration, but um, absolutely. Um, the article I just shared with you was from the perspective of a millennial, uh, first, uh, first time into the workforce straight out of college. There was another article um, uh, featuring a, and written by a reporter, uh, a former Newsweek reporter named Dan Lyons. Has anyone heard of that story. Um, he actually went and worked at HubSpot, a huge startup that went IPO a few years ago in Boston, Massachusetts. Is that right? And um, he told a story, again, you can Google this later, um, about his experience working in there. And I think what I gathered, I didn't do too much research, but from the first couple articles I read, he seemed a little perturbed sometimes by some of the millennials he was working with. So I guess my question, if John, you want to kick us off, is what kind of considerations does someone who's maybe not necessarily running the organization even like you are but working with Millennials who are in a different generation do they need to uh, change their ways of managing or bringing on people into a culture or even adjusting to a culture where they a non-millennial are the minority um, so the the, the um, piece is, that it was, is uh, in in a question here it's a book called disrupted it came out about two weeks ago, and it's gotten a lot of uh, reviews. Um, and so Lyons is a guy who w had been, lost his job at Newsweek, went to HubSpot. HubSpot has a very, um, I think, strong culture. It is, um, I think, fairly freewheeling. And some of it was goofy, in my own opinion. You know, I mean, honestly, I've had a lot of Millennials, we've never shot Nerf guns around the office and done shots of tequila in the middle of the day and so on. That said, there was, and I really recommend the book because he touches on a bunch of key points, but there's a fundamental, I think, point that needs to be taken out of that, what, what he writes, which is that Dan Lyons and HubSpot were destined to collide, and it comes down to one word, which is respect. Lions never respected the millennials, and the millennials didn't respect him. And I, he describes a culture that I have never seen before, but I believe you have to respect all individuals. You have to hire well to begin with, but if you don't respect them, you're going to put toxicity into the environment, and that's exactly what happened in that book. So if you don't respect, and I don't think it just applies to millennials, I think it applies to everybody, but in particular, if there's a view that because you're younger you don't know better, that's not right, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, and, and the same in reverse. And I say this, I'm working with three 20-year-olds, and I think what makes the magic is a high level of respect. Mm -hmm. 
And does that just come about? Is that your natural state of being, respecting everyone, or do you have to work at it? Is there a way in which you got to a point where you really respect their attributes, even despite the age gap, despite the differences? I mean, how did you get to a point of respect? That I, I think respect is earned. I mean, I, I, I'm not, um, I don't have unconditional respect, uh, and I try to hire well. Um, I think it has to be earned, but um, you know, if you are selective in who you work with, you'll have uh, sort of high-performing people who um, sort of compliment you, and I believe a big piece of that is not having um, a, a group think, being uh, able to be challenged. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I get challenged by my team, and when I'm wrong, I'm okay backing down. I don't need to win the argument. Um, and so that has to go both ways. Mm -hmm. If you have respect, you can get the magic because when you put the pieces together, there's every you know each kind of type of person bring, can bring something to the table. Great. Anyone else want to talk about that? The sure. dynamic between millennials and non-millennials in the workplace? Yeah. Um, so, so I, I believe in the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you like done unto you. So, I disagree a little bit about earning respect. I think you should give it, um, <laughs> and if you if you don't receive it back in turn, then okay, you can do away with that, that person or whatever. Um, I, I wanted to say something uh, that's a bit more general. When investing in early stage companies, the, the team and the culture are two of the most important things that you could, you could hope to look at, right? So when I'm thinking of a, a founder or a CEO, I'm looking for someone that is um, uh, mature enough to make decisions that are best for the, for the company and not necessarily best for themselves. Um, that's uh, mature enough to uh, that knows what they don't know and um, has the ability to receive um, coaching or, or counseling from others that, that may have a, a better understanding of a particular uh, scenario. And then um, from a culture perspective, uh, you really got to understand what you're trying to build um, and what that environment uh, should look like and then hire folks based on that, right? So I, I think a big part of um, this situation was they hired someone that just did not fit with the culture, right? So maybe he had great experience, but from a um, personality perspective, a uh, work style perspective, he just didn't fit. So it was destined to fail. So. I think, I think uh, Mandela, I think the, uh, there is a large friction amongst generations, and I, and I don't know if the problem's getting you know, more dramatic because technology and, the, and cultural shifts are happening at a much, much faster pace. So when I started college, this device did not exist. Like, you know, and, and it's scary to think about how much things have changed very quickly and dramatically with all the different tools and applications. And I think it's just uh, a lot of it comes down to a matter of communicating uh, with each other and, and sharing perspectives and understand that each uh, group of people, each individual and each person from, from their generation brings something new to the table and that there are skill sets that you know millennials have that by the way that we have college interns that you know they could do things that I could never you know I can't imagine myself doing uh, but then there are, of course there are very experienced executives that have different perspectives that I wouldn't have so it's about sharing those perspectives and communicating throughout the organization and I think the biggest friction with um, in any organization is information asymmetry. Is I have certain uh, assumptions in my head that you might not have, and so something that's obvious to you would seem not obvious to me at all. And so that you, you really have to have your team communicate and be open to the other person's perspective from that generation, from that time, or from their background and experience. And if you could do that, you could have a pretty well-functioning organization. But I do think that the just the structural gap is, is really quite large and, and technology is moving at an incredible pace. Uh, you know, our brains are not doubling capacity every 18 months. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, and uh, just to get a sense, because I, I I'm looking at the clock up here and I want to reserve time if anyone has questions, but um, just to get a sense, is there anyone in the room who is actually building products for our services for millennials? Anyone? Okay, great. Well, let's ask some questions about that. So, Andrew, you are definitely building products, uh, yep. a product for millennials. Um, I think you said it was a top website in the United States. What kind of what kind of things do you think about when developing the product, or how has it iterated based on what you've learned about your customers? Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, so Quizlet is a is a learning platform where uh, students put material on on the website or the app themselves, and then they get their friends to share. So, uh, one of the one of the pretty like unique characteristics is that teachers don't really need to be involved in it, or um, the the people who have shared Quizlet to date have often been. Uh, students sharing it with other students and then telling their teachers about it because they were successful because of it. And so uh, I think that's like a, a pretty big shift for sort of educational materials or resources where um, the, the materials are coming from the students themselves or maybe directly created by the teacher and there's very little involvement from the textbook publisher or sort of the sort of outside players. Uh, and so I think that um, you know the the biggest like influencers on those students that we work with are the like the students themselves rather than like their parents telling them to use any particular app or their teacher telling them to use any particular app. So we've tried to like for us the the way we succeed as a business financially and sort of user growth is by having a really good product that the students actually want to use and that actually helps them. And sort of none of the rest matters. We don't have a sales team. We don't have any sort of other parts of the system. It's all about the product. Got it. And Kate, I don't know if this applies to your product at Sense at all, but if it does, you feel free to. I mean, we don't build, sorry, I should have just built It's all right. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily build for millennials. I think we build our, I mean, our team is millennials. Um, mm -hmm. So the majority of our customers are parents um, and teachers. So I guess some of those are millennials. Um, but I, second to you, like we focus a lot right now on product because we've created this massive community around what we're doing. Um, and we don't have a sales team. We have a very small marketing team. Like it's really about the community um, that ha we, that's built itself kind of around our product and that's what's made us grow so quickly. Um, and that's, I think, why we've had success in raising money and getting people on board and um, just because we've kind of built this kind of community space. And I, I like to call it something like, you know, the millennials look at, at what their friends are doing and that influences what they do. And so the minute you can get somebody to talk, a friend to talk about something, your stickiness grows 10 to 100x that, and your, your LTV of that particular customer, it just shoots through the roof. So uh, we've, we've realized, I think, in the last year and a half that community is really where it's at, and that's where we're going to focus the most for energy, community, yeah. and product. Yeah, and can you ground that in some numbers? Like, how much did you guys grow? What period of time um, with this model? Yeah, uh, we, last year we grew almost 500%. <coughs> um, by really just focusing, like taking all money out of any marketing channels that we were doing and put it into community building um, and making the product better. So, mm -hmm. great, great. Um, and I'm going to get to Q&A right after this last question. So I was looking up some information about what they're going to call the next generation after millennials, and I came up blank. It was literally TBD. <laughs> and so I wanted to throw it out for the panelists up here to maybe give it a shot. And to get your wheel spinning, um, when the Pew Research um, person was on John Stewart's Daily Show, <laughs> they asked the audience to give it a try. They went on the street. You guys have seen the show. You know how this goes. Um, but some ideas that came about, you cannot use you have to come up with your own are tweenials, screeners, because everything they do is via screen, conflict generation, because of all the wars and conflicts going on, the at, at symbol generation, are the swipe generation. So those are just a couple. I don't know if they suit what your idea is for the next generation. And again, you can think of it as 16 years uh, old and younger. So if anyone has an idea, we'd love to maybe get a new name for this up and coming generation. Any takers? Oh, well, oh go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I have to, I, two things come to mind. One is the word exponential, because I think we're, we're gonna see exponential progress. I mean, I think that generation will be the generation that colonizes Mars, that generation will be the one that <laughs> cures cancer, that generation will be the one does whatever, whatever you can imagine, right? Nanobots building bridges across the Pacific Ocean. Anything you could, you could seriously, it's, it sounds crazy, but I think that's the, 
you know, there will be some really exponential technology uh, growth in that generation. The other, the other funny one, and being cheeky, is to just call them the cyborg generation. <laughs> All right. All right. Anyone else? I was just at an, an event late earlier, or last week, I guess, and Erica Orange was speaking about how it's like the Cytron, organ, uh, like, uh, like the cyber um, set of, of youth and, and how they're g probably going to be the most entrepreneurial. Um, but yeah, you should check out her article. I, I cannot sum it up in, in <laughs> 10 words or less, but um, Erica Orange had a, a really good conversation about that last week. All right. Erica Orange, everybody. Third one on your list. Anyone else have an idea? Yeah, John. Well, it's not an idea, but as the parent of an 11-year-old who fights the daily battle of screen addiction and has a <laughs> weekly holy war, I think screeners uh, will work for the ones that I know. All right. Okay. Anyone else agree? Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. I, I would say uh, I think there's a, with, with AI and with um, sort of other technologies that, that augment humanity or like you can be more creative and create more interesting music or uh, sort of write more interesting programs with AI technology, I think there could be sort of like an augmented generation. It's like a cyborg generation sort of related to that idea where like uh, most of the people in this next generation will have sort of superpowers that are, that are augmented by a like computer programming stuff. Right. Marlon? <laughs> oh. All right, <laughs> TBD, all right. Um, well, you guys, we're gonna transition into questions right now, so if you have any, again, we only have 13 minutes, it's a short session, so if you could just be cognizant of your question and how it's coming out, that would be awesome. Um, I may have to cut it short, and panelists, if you guys can just maybe answer one um, each, that would be great. So first one, go ahead, and if you wanna stand, that's fine. Yeah, um, it, it's an issue I thought a bit about. So, I mean, if you think about life in terms of a systems view of thinking, um, systems want balance, and our systems are increasingly out of balance, like all of them, environmental, you know, economic, political, et cetera. And so, if you have grown up in this age, you don't see stability. And if you don't see stability, that is a breeding ground for not trusting. And not trusting is a breeding ground for cynicism. All right, next question, uh, right up here. There's a microphone now, so thank you. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. My name is Rahul, it rhymes with Yahoo, easy to remember. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a CEO of uh, interedge.org. My question is at the intersection of communication and culture, so about cross-cultural communication, and we are in a tech industry, uh, and we talked about Yelp example and HubSpot example. What opportunities and challenges does cross-cultural communication play, especially in tech sector, and especially with millennials who are uh, very global in this perspective? Thank you. Well, I, I think where it's uh, where communication is going is um, text-based communication. Um, it's it's become already kind of the de facto method, right? Um, and you're starting to see a lot more chat applications and um, a lot of uh, technology within chat applications. So, you know, Facebook just announced bots in, in their messaging. Um, there are, you know, other messaging um, platforms that, that I've seen that are embedding all this, all this technology so you can basically achieve everything that you do in your everyday life through this chat um, uh, vehicle. So I, I think that that's probably what's what's going to happen. Um, we're going to start uh, communicating, I think, in more pithy ways um, to, to deal with this. There's um, you know one of the companies we're looking at right now is trying to um, uh, redefine the way that we read books, right? Starting to read books on on cell phones in small bite sizes, um, which is hugely popular and successful already in Asia. So I think text chat. Uh, I would add one small thing. I think uh, with the early days of the internet, there were sort of forums where people from all over different cultures and different countries would 
be in the same place. And I think that's sort of decreased over time as Facebook and these other platforms have, have succeeded. And I think that actually decreases the amount of cross-cultural exchange because most of the communication happens with people you know or people you sort of sort of know. Uh, and there's people are spending less time on these sort of more open-ended sort of open <coughs> internet systems. So disagree a little bit. Um, it's, in terms of meeting new people, um, probably, probably correct. But when you're convening around a particular topic or you're convening um, with, with folks that you already know in different parts of the world, um, I'm finding that, we're finding that chat is, is actually a great tool for that. Question right here. Here Andrew, I'm curious. I believe you started Quizlet when you were in high school and then just kept it going throughout college until you built it into a formidable company now. And the next generation of millennials has already sort of been born and is um, in school, et cetera. Maybe they're still millennials, but you know what I'm saying. If you had to give any advice for people working in the K-12 system to help transition people into the kind of adults that we need to support society. Um, given your experiences, what would you say? Hmm. That's a tough question. Uh, so yeah, so I, I started Quizlet when I was 15 as a sophomore in high school for a French class and worked on it through college and then really got it started after college uh, and started hiring a team. Uh, the interesting experience for me was how I got into programming, which was how I managed to start Quizlet. And that was through an independent research project I had to do in eighth grade, where I, you chose your own topic, and then you uh, had a choice of a bunch of different types of presentations for your final project. And it was like an eight or nine week project. So it was like a serious piece of research. And I did mine on mob psychology, and I chose to make a website, because that was one of the options. And I thought that was really cool. And so I built this website, and it, uh, and it like, I learned all these technologies and all these things that I was just sort of exploring. And so I think uh, like creating opportunities that are more open-ended like that, uh, where, you can, where the students can create their own thing or sort of uh, explore different technologies or not have to like answer a very specific question uh, can can lead to really interesting outcomes uh, I think uh, but on the the broader question like how do we how do we create good citizens like that's a that's a hard question I think uh, you know the the system right now is so oriented towards standardized tests in education. And I think that uh, is to the detriment of, of creating like strong citizens and or creating citizens that are thinking about uh, like society and culture rather than just like specifically like math and reading. All right, next question. I think we had one up here and then. Can I, can I add? Yeah, really quickly, Lee. If, if the 3,500 people who are here at this conference this week can figure out the answer to that one question will yeah. change the world. <laughs> yeah. All right. um, my name is Mario Martinez from National University System. And a lot of the conversation to me seems to address millennials who are maybe from middle upper middle class families or address higher on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we're concerned about uh, first generation students, students who um, they may know about Spotify and some of these things, but there are more pressing needs to get them into college and a college education. So through the discussion, I'm trying to bridge the, the trends, the ideas that you're talking about, the social good, Marlon, that you spoke about a little bit earlier, with getting them into college. I mean, things that we consider critical uh, that are more important than, you know, just giving them a starting point. So I was wondering if anybody can address some of those things. So the, the need for college is in, is in question these days, right? Do you, do you actually need to go to college, right? There are um, tons of um, programs that, that teach inner city or at-risk youth how to, how to program. Um, and what we're seeing is uh, Van Jones has, has an organization, the name is slipping me right now. Yes We Code? Yes We Code. Um, 
definitely focused on um, inner city ethnic minority um, children. And what we're seeing is, or what they're seeing is, uh, these kids are building solutions that are relevant to the problems that they see in, in their environments. Um, so as an investor, this is incredible for me, right? Because what you're talking about is uh, creating solutions for new markets um, in a new market that's on track to become the majority in America very soon, right? In K through 12, it's already uh, majority minority or minority majority, however you say it. Um, uh, so I don't know if, uh, if uh, you know, uh, I was a founder of an of a organization, nonprofit organization that uh, helped inner city students get to college, right? Um, I don't know, I'm wrestling, and I think we, we did a good job um, getting a bunch of them to, to top, top schools. Um, but now I'm wrestling with, you know, uh, is, that the right, is that the right approach, right? Um, are, their families are already in debt, um, so going to college, they're, they're going to amass more debt, right? And so then they're going to graduate and figure out how to, um, you know, how am I going to pay this debt? So I'm going to take a job, probably a job that I don't really want to do. I'm not passionate about, I'm not, um, it doesn't drive me, right? And I'm just trying to spend the rest of my life climbing out of debt. So is college the right, the right way? I, I don't know. Yeah, and John? So I think this is one of the, I think, three biggest issues that our society has. And uh, it comes back to something that was identified a while ago that the single biggest predictor of life success today now is your zip code. And what we have is a self-reinforcing circle because K-12 is funded by local real estate taxes. So wealthy towns have more resources, less wealthy towns have less. And so you have a substantial portion of the population that does not have realistic economic mobility. And so this is not, I think, something that the private sector itself can take on. It's a much bigger public kind of issue for society at large. But if we don't solve it, um, that's where your social unrest is going to really sort of start to really emanate from. Yeah. I really appreciate the question, too, especially the work we do at KPOR Capital. Um, I appreciate the fact that you called out um, not bucketing all millennials into one arena, especially when it comes to zip code, socioeconomic status, race, gender, et cetera. Um, and it's also for everybody, you know, just prompting you to think about, you know, the products that you are building for whatever subset of millennials we're talking about, are they gap widening or gap closing, right? And that's a whole other conversation, but you know where to find me. Um, all right, uh, we have time for maybe one, two more questions. This gentleman, you had your hand raised, go ahead. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, so, John, I think I've really resonated with your concept, really as a non-millennial CEO, that you approach, you know, your employees around, um, understand their perspective when you're wrong, you're wrong, and that's great. Lee, you've talked a lot about the idea of purpose and how millennials really resonate with that, and I really love the idea of respect, that that should be just naturally the default behavior. But to me, really, the common thread is shared accountability you know, really ensuring that both everyone that's involved in the organization, even those that you're partnering with, has that shared accountability is important. How do you, you know, how have you infused shared accountability into your organization, and what kind of outcomes has that produced for you, either negative or positive? Um, you know, yeah. And that could be for anyone. Yeah, Kate, you talked a little bit about this, what you do when you onboard people, kind of setting out their goals. Was there anything else you do to address this question about shared accountability? Yeah, um, am I on? I turned mine off. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what when you guys were talking earlier about um, you know generational gaps? I mean, I, I think the oldest employee in my company is twenty years older than me, and I'm his boss, um, and so that's kind of an interesting dynamic to have. Um, but you know, I think at the end of the day, like you have your KPIs, you have the things that you you're focused on as, as an organization, and everybody has to be on board with that. Um, and it, I think that accountability sharing is what's important. And I think. You're, um, you guys were talking earlier about um, you know, mutual respect, and I think wh whenever I go into a meeting where we're talking about big picture things that the company is doing, we say that everybody needs to check their ego at the door, and everybody needs to think that everybody's on this, the same level playing field, and I think that helps a lot going into it. Um, whether you're a millennial or you know, an older generation, it doesn't, you need to be on the same playing field. Yeah. Anyone else, really quickly? 
All right. Um, well, you guys, we really want to thank you for taking the time to be here as the late, well, not the late, but the great Jay-Z once said, you could have been anywhere in the world right now, but you're here with me, and I appreciate that. Um, no, but in all seriousness, you guys, I hope the conversation was great. Um, I just want to say the common theme I've seen is empathy. Right? How, how willing and able are you to put yourself in someone else's shoe to push back on your own paradigms, et cetera? But um, really appreciate the panelists. If you guys can give them a round of applause for their time, they're fantastic. And lastly, if you've come up with a name for the next generation, make sure you write The Daily Show, all right? Um, have a good one, you guys. See you around.